Okay, welcome, 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 guys, gals, and non-binary pals to this week's episode of Buffy Boys, your weekly review of Buffy the Vampire Slayer from a queer, literary, and feminist perspective. Um, my name is Joel, I'm one of your hosts, and with me is my inimitable co-host... Brian! Hi! Hi, hi, hi. Uh, so this week we will be watching, reviewing, and talking about uh, the second episode of Season 3 of Buffy, Dead Man's Party. If you can hear that, that is a cat assiduously trying to claw his way out of the apartment into the one below. Yep. Uh, well done, Booker. He's a smart cat. Um, I like him. Booker, you're going to hear some distressing things with cats in this episode, but maybe just take it as a warning. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we showed him uh, Pet Cemetery the other day, just as a, you know, kind of like a... a Scare him straight. Exactly. It was kind of like showing the, the Krampus to German kids when they're young. <laughs> Um, so this is, yep, Dead Man's Party, Season 3, Episode 2. It was first aired on October 6th, 1998, and it was directed by James Whitmore Jr., who also directed I Only Have Eyes For You. We went through him at the time, he's done a bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. And it was written by Marty Noxon, who also wrote uh, I Only Have Eyes For You. I think she wrote it with Joss Whedon. So they've, these guys have worked together before, so they have no excuse. Um, I think it's fair to say, Brian, I stand Marty Noxon. Oh, do you? Yeah, I think she, she does some great stuff on the show. I'm great. always excited when I hear Marion Mar- Mar- Oxen is being involved. Good, good, good. I've forgotten the book I need to do the Buffy on summary, so I'll be right back. Clip, clip, clip. Clop, clop, clop. Sorry about that. It turns out I uh, have lost that book, so I um, bought a new copy, and um, here I am. Or you could just spin it straight, straight up the top of your dome, just freestyle what happens in this episode, Buffy and Summary. I was about to wrap this summary, and oh I was God. like, oh no, don't do that. Um, the gang and Joyce are still furious with Buffy for not contacting them. This erupts into bitter argument, sorry, okay, this erupts into bitter argument during a welcome back party and is resol- resolved by an zo- attack of zombies raised by an African mask from Joyce's art gallery. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow, that is the worst one yet. That's it? That's the worst one yet. Yeah, that's it. That's oh, oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so this is Dead Man's Party. So um, the one with the, uh, as you said, the African zombie mask, uh, in which uh, the Buffy returns to Sunnydale, tries to reconnect with her friends, tries to deal with a lot of issues they have with her, which we will unpack. Yeah. Uh, and this is resolved in the most classic, hearthwarming of American ways, um, fighting off zombies. Exactly. And catharsis through um, narratively sanctioned murder. That's it. That's the only way to do it. So, Brian, other than Buffy... <laughs> it's been so long since we did one of these, but we just came up with a really good name for this part where we bullshit about something that happened this week or mm-hmm. something we want to talk about, and it's uh, The Buff Light, which I think is actually quite funny. Buff Light. Okay. Yeah, I can, I, I, I can roll with that. Oh, good. So, other than Buffy, uh, what have we been watching this week? What's, what's, <laughs> what's color, color interest? Uh, so, we've been watching like copious amounts of Nathan For You. Which is maybe the funniest TV show ever made, in my opinion. I would like to point out that we we, we might have mentioned before, but we read a, a list of basically very good TV shows that we found online that was uh, from a, a reputable publication, which we really agreed with because we already watched a lot of them. But there was maybe one or two on there which I said, you know, Brian, of all the ones I haven't seen, I don't think I'd be interested in watching these couple of shows. They're just not for me. Of course, that's the one you picked out and said, let's watch three seasons of it. Uh, there are four seasons in total, so we have to get another season soon. Okay. But, but Nathan, for you, uh, p- 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 pitch to me what is Nathan for you a bit. Okay, so Nathan a Fielder is a comedian, uh, but no one knows this. So he comes along to your small business and he gives you advice about how to improve your small business. And uh, for the contestants, like, I mean, the people who are involved in the show, um, like, who, who own the businesses, for what all they know, basically, it is a straight up and down reality TV show with no element to it of comedy. Mm-hmm. However, Nathan Fielder is doing an act. He is acting as this incompetent guy with awful ideas who uh, has to try to convince the people then to actually do these things. So no one on this show knows that it's a comedy show except for Nathan Fielder. <clears throat> and he pretends like it's not. It's brilliant. So the first episode is uh, him, he comes to a frozen yogurt stand and he's like, a frozen yogurt shop, and he convinces the guy, he's like, so I have a great idea for you. What you need to do to get people into your shop, um, you need to cause some controversy and I want you to start selling poo-flavored frozen yogurt. <laughs> and uh, the guy's like, mm, I'm not going to do that. And he's like, but you should. So the guy's like, okay, because there's, a reality show happening and the cameras are there so you can't say no really so uh, they go off and they devise this and then they watch people as they taste this poo flavoured frozen mm-hmm. yogurt and they're all 
pretty disgusted. So this is and what, it's amazing. This is what we've been doing our time. So I feel like that your your estimation of our our, our critical uh, cr- critical analysis uh, faculties may may diminish. Go um, watch Nathan for you. It's so fucking funny. It is. It is arrestingly awkward to it's watch. It's brilliant. It's, it's fascinating. Actually, genius. And the most important thing to go into when you watch an episode, and you can find loads of these clips on, online, particularly because yeah. a number of things he's done has has gone internationally viral uh, accidentally. But like viral within the context of the show, if you get me, as in like yeah, so viral in, in the same like I mean basically everyone who who like allows it to go viral are like unwittingly becoming a participant in the show rather than a viewer of the show. So he'd make up a fake uh, fitness movement and then the fake sp- spokesperson for the movement would, would be straightforwardly interviewed on dozens of, of news programs about <clears throat> and, the fitness movement. And the book that they ghost wrote for it, um, for this fitness movement went to the Amazon bestselling charts and stuff like this. Uh, a book in which they erroneously claimed that the uh, spokesperson uh, was a childhood friend of Steve Jobs and also had spent some time uh, teaching Quote unquote, jungle children. Yep. So, segue into this episode about a, a Nigerian zombie uh, demon from a collection of primitive art, uh, quote unquote, uh, from the oh. context of this episode. So, it's a little ropey on the um, representation of minority groups side of things. It's a little um, voodoo panic. Um, it is a voodoo panicky. Um, so, I mean, like, they don't go into it too much, thank fuck. But, um, yeah, the idea here is that Joyce has... I mean, like, maybe there's something to be said here about the fact that Joyce has put this on her wall and um, it's basically a piece of uh, yeah, primor- primal art. Primal art? What did she say? Well, she calls it primitive art, which I don't, know, art. I don't know enough about it, but <clears> my, my gut feeling is that is not the best way to frame it. Literally, unless it's, like, 5,000 years old, don't refer to something as primitive if it's from another country, because that's just offensive. Mm. But, uh, so she hangs up this mask on her wall, and, like, I mean, remember that part of time in the 90s when everyone was putting weird African tribal masks in their walls? I mean, like, maybe this is... No? This is not an experience you had? Not specifically, but I, I, I do specifically remember a period, definitely when I was younger, where people had vaguely african quote-unquote inspired things in their house yeah like they can really have any context for it. we should actually look into that i bet you there was some sort of like african like decoration movement because yeah i mean like african like tribal artwork is definitely a thing that happened in the 90s but um maybe this is a comment on this like you know the suggestion that like you that kind of appropriation of culture um can have unforeseen consequences but at the same time, it's hard to look past the fact that it's this mask that causes a bunch of people to raise from the dead, voodoo style. So, I mean, no, I don't think it's, I think it's pretty indefensible. If, if we if we strip away from that, the one, the one interesting thing in a, from a lower point of view is that this is the first proper introduction of zombies as a monster of the week, as opposed to, like, there have been one or two people who have been raised from the dead, or sure, one or two people sure. who have been in... Uh, uh, literally in the background of nightmare sequences but as the monster this is the first inclusion of, of zombies and obviously the traditional um horror uh trope of zombies originally comes from a, a various interpretations and stories of this voodoo tradition which are quite different from how we would um understand zombies in terms of the post romero uh you know, a virus infects people and re- reanimates them, and then obviously your modern kind of um, fast zombies, fast zombies from um, twenty eight days later and, and things like that. So this is, I suppose, the most fantasy or the most folkloric interpretation of zombies as a, a spell that has rean- reanimated corpses. I actually would know very little about the history of zombies. I mean, like, so you're suggesting that they're not a very Western concept, like, um, stretching back too far? Because, I mean, like, I, I'm trying yeah. to think now, like, there isn't really a huge amount of zombie-like uh, monsters in, in traditional European and American folklore. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so um, yeah, so in terms of the origin of the concept of a zombie, so obviously, you know, the idea of people being reanimated after death is not um, a particularly modern concept, but the zombies specifically um, have their etymological and their their folklore root in uh, Haitian society and in the voodoo, of course, culture okay. and voodoo religion. But they're very different from how we would um, conceive of a zombie now. Like in many ways, the person wasn't necessarily even dead uh, as a corpse but it was someone who was put under uh, control of someone who was mastering them with a spell they could be dead they could be reanimated but they're much more uh, enthralled uh, i wonder what it, what it is about you know haitian culture specifically that would like cause that to occur 
you know, in the same way that we've we've talked a lot about what, how vampires are, like have arisen in the West and uh, like as a as a myth, you know, in terms of its um, you know people masquerading and you know it's like you know the threat of the that like you know unknowable male force. I wonder what it is about zombies that like you know like that made it um, like you know exist in that culture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's probably. Uh, deeper than we could go into kind of in a, sim- in a single overview but there's various aspects there in terms of uh, social uh, uh, kind of uh, hierarchy issues in terms of sure. um, you know, slavery and, and, and mastery over other people in terms of um, the sheer power dynamics uh, kind of within small communities but that's kind of the original um the most the most significant uh, original genesis for the concept of a zombie which becomes starts to leak into more western culture in kind of the 1800s uh, and kind of has prototypical examples even things like um, frankenstein and mary shelley could be considered uh, as a zombie in certain sure. tra- traditions uh, and then more specifically what we associate with it is um in kind of definitely the 20th century mid to late 20th century particularly with the uh, night of the living dead the day of the living dead that whole tradition of um rooting the zombie as what i would consider to be the modern monster yeah because um not every tradition by far uh, or every version of a zombie requires it could be passed um by a virus and and it certainly doesn't in this episode but I think in terms of that becoming such a predominant image of the zombie, it's because it allows us to be a little more, the suspension of disbelief is a little more for us modern, discerning, intelligent, science-driven people. It's like, oh, well, a virus, that could definitely may- yeah. maybe happen. As a, zombie vi- a zombie virus, like, you know, that does fit into a modern narrative in a less fanciful way than yeah, other things. It can, be, it can feel like science fiction rather than fantasy. Exactly. It's compelling. And if, if he's, you know, in the same way that the classic conception of a zombie um, which incidentally historically uh, would have been spelled without the E so Zego MBI um, but the modern conception of zombie feeds into our fears of kind of de- densely populated urban areas of, uh, of the mindlessness of the modern life as well hugely I mean yeah. like you know the Romero zombies are they are a metaphor because they they represented the oncoming of the industrial or the like the, I mean I suppose the, the height of the industrial era and the kind of that like tendency of people to feel like they're like zombie like in their day to day life. Yeah, mass consumerism, all that kind of stuff. And zombies really, I think in the modern horror tradition, when used well, can be one of the great metaphors. Um, but not necessarily in in this episode, or not necessarily every yeah. time a reanimated corpse yeah. appears. I gotta say, Mike. I mean, around two thousand and twelve or so, there was like a real peak um, wave of new zombie content. So you had The Walking Dead. You had what you call it? That book that you like? Uh, Z. Uh, World War Z. World War Z. You had um, that thing about the zombie. You see about the gay zombie teenager. Yeah, was it called I Zombie or I Zombie is a different show. Oh, yeah. sorry, it was something something a lot. Apparently, I Zombie is quite good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so it was by someone who did um, the person who did like Veronica Mars and stuff is I Zombie. Hmm. So apparently, it is actually worth watching. But Rob um, Zombie, of course. <laughs> but um, like very few really good zombie properties at that time, unfortunately. So I mean, like it was a renaissance, but without a a real leader. A locum, yeah. Yeah. Adventureland was pretty good. No, sorry. Zombieland. <laughs> Adventureland is a very different <laughs> Jesse Eisenberg movie. Yeah, it's a strange sequel. Um, so, one of the interesting things about zombies in this episode is that one of the international titles that they, they released, because I check the international titles sure, every yeah. week for, um, but one of them was just The Night of the Living Dead. Yeah. It was just kind of like, it's so funny that some someone out there was like titling this and they're just like, just fucking call it. Just Night call of the, the thing. <laughs> but like, I know that emotion so well of yeah. just like, we need to put something here for this content. We need to give this thing a title. Just fucking whatever. I don't yeah. give a shit. I have to do that every day with uh, in work. So, <laughs> so working backwards, like the, the zombies, of course, are not the specific focus of this episode, but they're there to give a emotional climax or catharsis to the issues that Buffy is experiencing and trying to reintegrate yeah. into some Italian uh, society. As Ander very like is it, like very bluntly puts it, uh, you can't bury your feelings. Um, they always come back to haunt they always you. come back to haunt yeah. you so in this in this episode uh, Buffy's emotions are you know becoming live with, like you know in the world um, is this a point at which I can say uh, don't like this episode I think it's shit yeah don't you, like it at all you weren't a fan of this episode not a fan of this episode at all uh, I think we talk a lot about the characters voices mm-hmm. 
I think even Xander was speaking out of character in this episode with the vitriol he was spewing towards Buffy. Sure. So the central conceit of this episode, or the central issue, is that Buffy returns and there's a lot of repressed um, or un- initially unspoken feeling about people being frustrated with her being away for various reasons and her feeling like the people don't care about her, etc. So that's the central argument. And there's two things that happen, two fundamental things with this episode that I think you and I probably will mutually agree to uh, to disagree with the episode on. One is that the premise of the episode accepts the the premise that she has done something wrong. Yep. Now, now, not that she hasn't, she's definitely causing distress. She is definitely, there is definitely a complex feelings in there. Um, she's acting in some ways rashly, etc. Absolutely. But the way the episode presents it, in my opinion, supports the premise that she should be apologizing to xander and that kind of thing and then the main issue being that when they, they throw this incongruous party in their house and if like oh come on man let's go to a kegger in in so in summer's house etc that kind of thing to try and welcome her back uh, and dingo's ate my baby play there as well bizarrely yeah. in her sitting room but when this blows up and her and joyce and all the scoobies get into an argument with with each other the as you said the voice when they're arguing with buffy it just it sounds like they're being the reading lines at gunpoint a little bit. You know, feels- you know, what it reminds me of is there's an episode of Gilmore Girls that's really upsetting where uh, where um, Lorelai is overhearing uh, Rory and Paris talking, and basically Paris tells Rory that she's uh, lost her virginity, and she's like quite upset, like like Paris is quite like shaken by this. Mm. Uh, like basically Lorelai is listening to this and Rory is giving her counsel and yeah. she basically says, yeah, no, I haven't had sex with um, with Dean and et cetera, et cetera. And Lorelai um, says to herself, I have the good, I got, I got the good kid. Yeah. And apparently, yeah. Um, apparently Lauren, Graham. Lauren Graham like argued ferociously to not say that line because she just totally disagreed with it. And it wasn't in the character of the in character of it because like Lauren Graham wouldn't like shame someone for having sex or wouldn't. Laura like Gilmore. Laura like L- Gilmore. Lauren Graham probably wouldn't shame someone. Oh, for Lauren Graham definitely either. wouldn't. Lauren Graham's yeah. a wonderful person, but Laura like Gilmore would definitely not like couldn't like judge someone for having sex. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, and like this felt like a very similar thing where like the, like Willow specifically like the kind of horrible things she's saying in this episode to Buffy, it's just so unlikely. There's there's one part of this episode that I feel. Uh, specifically Willow speaking in voice and it's where she's talking to Buffy about the fact that she had a very difficult summer herself discovering herself um, learning witchcraft and all that and she didn't have her best friend I believe that but there's an aspect of the confrontation where they're handing lines back and forth to each other and then Cordelia is like sorry Xander try to put yourself in Buffy's shoes I will speak now for my bit how about you Oz well I'm Oz and I think yeah, it's, it's a bit of that kind yeah. everyone has to get get their lines now so, uh, Buffy does have a very nice line where she says Cordy please get out of my shoes <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, but I think Joyce speaks most in characters right there. I agree. Episode. Yeah, um, Joyce has some complex, like complex emotions yeah. in this episode, and that's that's interesting and good. Uh, Corgi kind of does, insofar as the fact that she kind of just is off in her own world a yeah. little bit. And um, Giles is off on his own. I feel like Giles is on his own B plot for this whole episode. He was though. Giles's sto- like plotting and characterization was pretty good for the episode. Yes, and Angel does because he just appears in a dream sequence, same mysterious, <laughs> cryptic fucking shit as yep. usual. <laughs> Um, but like, I mean, like even, so Xander says horrible stuff, uh, like, so he says, uh, I'm sorry you're, that your honey was a demon, but most girls don't hop in a greyhound over boy troubles. Like, Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah, and How horrible do you have to say, be to say about that? He says something like, you know, that he'll stop treating her, um, he'll stop annoying her once she stops acting like an idiot. Yeah. Like, I mean, obviously they, they don't know what's happened to Buffy over the summer. She hasn't told them yet. And that's, you know... Fair enough. I mean, mm. in one way, they, they're they presuming not the worst, which is absolutely what happened. Yeah. But, I mean, maybe you have some sensitivity towards this person who has shown great judgment, has saved everyone's lives hundreds of times, has sacrificed fights her own life, literally, at one point, for all of them. Uh, she has, like, you know, defended them extensively, emotionally and physically. And uh, they're like, oh, well, she fucked off for a summer. She probably did it, like, you know, just to annoy us, basically. And it's kind of like, you know, Buffy deserves the benefit of the date here. Yeah, I have the, I have an understanding for Joyce in this absolutely because I think she has the most comp, she's the most difficult role here. She's trying to, she's trying not to drive Buffy off again. Essentially, you know, she's trying yeah. to integrate her back in while still having all the normal emotions that a parent would have. And uh, what I think is interesting is 
this again similarly to the end of season two plays very much off the um the classic coming out narrative and there's a lot no, of dialogue yeah. which is ripped straight from that that starter script with things like where um buffy says you don't understand what i was going through uh who i was or all that kind of stuff and joyce says you know that um i'm you know i'm trying to adjust i i messed up it took me by surprise i think you just drop this on me just drop this i think i'm trying to process it um but you can't blame me for that for the rest of my life you know we have to grow and continue you know um and what comes with that coming out narrative is oftentimes a very difficult thing to parse which is like you understand joyce's position even when you feel annoyed for what she's doing Mm -hmm. and that is unfortunately or not maybe unfortunately is the wrong word but part of the coming out narrative with parents is often that i really am unhappy with what you've done but also i can kind of see your perspective even though you've handled this really badly. It's very difficult to make people explicitly villains in well, a situation where they're trying to deal with something like at this. At the same yeah. time, Joel, I mean, like, if you look at the storylines for all these characters, uh, Willow and Xander, I mean, like, Xander has just told Buffy to kick his ass with Angel and mm-hmm. then she disappeared for a summer. Uh, Willow, fair enough, like, you know, she woke up from a coma and her best friend was gone. That's yeah. difficult. Um, but, like, at the same time, that doesn't warrant the kind of judgment that they send towards her, especially given that she they haven't asked her about her experience and they haven't waited to find out what happened to her. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, like, Joyce has just found out that her daughter is, like, <laughs> a fucking <laughs> supernatural entity and she has to go off and kill vampires and zombies and shit. Like, that's a lot to take in. That is difficult, and it's difficult to deal with. Yeah. And, uh, importantly, Pat says at one point that Buffy has been reading... We need to explain who Pat is. We need to introduce Pat yeah, into okay. the story. Yeah. So Pat is... Uh, bu- uh, she is she is Joyce's, like, lesbian lover surrogate daughter, <laughs> who she, like, the friend who she makes over the summer because Buffy's gone... In, in her book re- club. In her book club. Yeah, where they read uh, The Deep End of the Ocean, uh, which is a 1996 book by Jacqueline Mitchard, but it's actually about a, a boy who goes missing um, <laughs> and uh, it tears their family apart. And when he comes back, he basically turns up on their door one day offering to like wash their car or something. And they're like, what the fuck? It's years later. And who are like, where were you? And uh, yeah, it's a book about that. It was turned into a movie. It was, it was actually one of, I think it was potentially Oprah's first book club book okay which is interesting and this is what joyce chose to read in her book club yeah yeah um so uh you can understand why that was a bit triggering for her and she needed a bit of help with that um the dad in the book who is very um wary of the child coming back and quite the doubter doubting thomas is called pat so they obviously lifted that from the book Mm -hmm. they also did an adaptation of the movie with with a a movie adaptation of it i think with michelle pfeiffer Mm. um in about 1999 uh that only got about 45 percent in ron tomatoes Okay. Anyway, so basically, but, Pat inserts herself into this uh, situation. Yeah, she she does have very like uh, like we're not trying to read this into everything, but she goes have very lesbian vibes. She's, she's always just like always smiling at Joyce and she, just like I'm Joyce, here for you. How are you actually? I know it's been very difficult, and then also been kind of giving Buffy the cold sugar a bit, yeah. being like, oh well, you know, your mother was very distressed since you went off gallivanting. Or and whatever, uh, so. oh hey, Buffy, make sure not to get any more flights of fancy and running off. Yeah. Um. She also like. She like they have, there's a really weird like quiet 15 second scene where her and where Pat and Joyce do schnapps together, but it's like very like intimate, intimate, and just like no one's saying anything for a good like 15 seconds. <laughs> yeah. It's just like so. Do you know? Do you recognize the Pat actress? The Pat actress, um, I do recognize. I'm not sure why. So, uh, she's been in lots of shit. So like a lot of stuff. She's every like daytime Emmy winning TV show ever made. She's had a fork episode run it. But what I know her from is she is Nancy Ryan from Beep. So she's Jonah's mother. Yes, she is. Yes. Remember, she's always like being mm-hmm. very nice to him. Anyway, so that's 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 what I remember her from. Um, but what importantly, you know, in one of the most on the nose um, thematic links I've ever seen, uh, Joyce has an incredibly delivered line where um, she basically talking about like, oh, couldn't you just tell like a few people that you're the slayers so you can get a dispensation maybe you know the police and the school because special circumstances you know they should know they have a a superhero i'm sorry is that the is that the right word is that offensive yeah and it's it's it's, it's pitch perfect it's uh, so and good the uncomfort the uncomfortable look on buffy's face which is like i kind of don't want you talking about my specific thing ever yeah, again yeah, yeah. yeah um christine Sutherland does a great job on this episode and she's just beautiful looking she mm. just looks like such uh like she's like the actual epitome of like maternal warmth in this show i just i think i think she's wonderful she's a she's a prototypical diane lockhart just in terms of a 
uh, from Good Wife. She's a powerful woman who wears big necklaces and yeah. all of her. Yeah, you know, yeah, and you want her to be your mom. Yeah. Um, she also says at one point uh, to Buffy when she's she's like basically leaving to go hang out with the Scoobs. Um, she's like, "Oh, will you be slaying?" <laughs> <laughs> and so, like you know, will you be going to the gay club? Yeah. And uh, then Buffy has a very nice retort, which is, um, "Only if they give me lip." <laughs> <laughs> Um, which is also uh, what you tend to say to your parents when they ask you if you're going to the gay club. That's okay. Well, that's getting cut from this episode, so that's fun. Where uh, also um, one of the essays I've referred to a couple of times before that I've read is about um, it's called uh, choosing your own mother, and I was talking about it because Je- Je- uh, Jenny uh, represents a maternal figure. Um, so does that. So does Maggie, uh, Professor Maggie Walsh, and yep. so does that yeah. uh, watcher who comes along with Faith and stuff. So it's like the kind of the search from the for the um, for the maternal role, um, and she kind of does highlight this episode as being the sorry Williams in this uh, essay highlights Joyce as having kind of like a failed maternal role in it. Um, so just it's an interesting one, a perceived failed maternal role, I think definitely. Yeah, yeah, I think I I don't I don't. It's a weird one. Like, Joyce definitely wasn't in the right here, but I think she's a dynamic approach, and it's a well-written character moment of just this confusion and attempt to be supportive and scared and etc. Yeah, it's not about doing the right thing. It's about being believable in your yeah. actions, and Joyce is believable. Speaking of um, speaking of parental roles, uh, Giles, of course, in this episode is, is actually quite good. So when they go to his apartment to be like, oh, look, here's Buffy, he immediately, like, tries to... Uh, he his first his first instinct is to kind of like ask Buffy about like all about where she was and what's happened and stuff, and he very quickly like pushes that down to be supportive of her. Mm-hmm. So um, he's like, "So wonderful to see you, and I'm so happy that you're back." And then he goes and has a little cry in the kitchen because he's so relieved that she's home. And just like I mean, and then when the uh, when the scoops are like trying to press her for information a little bit, he's like, "Oh no, leave her alone. Like you know, give her a bit of space, basically." And it's actually like, it's kind of like, oh, so you were somewhat, the writers of this episode were somewhat aware that like Willow and Xander are being dicks because yeah, they yeah. Were, managed to write Giles being nice. Um, he also just has a very funny like side plot, yeah, where he's... Uh, it, 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 no, except for closely acted and that part with Giles. But yeah, his side plot is essentially in a very Peck Cemetery moment. I'm amazed that no one's at Peck Cemetery at any point in this episode. Yeah. But... Um, they find a dead cat in Buffy's basement, which is not relevant. It's to never the explained. No. It's just a stray cat that exists only to be resurrected. To be resurrected, and then trying to understand why the why the vampire, why the cat is is dead, and then this leaks eventually. Um, for Giles to figure out that it's the mask, and um, which has the um spirit of a zombie demon of Umambi, it incorporated in the mask. But uh, he's driving. He's trying to like get through to Buffy's raging house party and there's two cool surfer, du- du- surfer dukes who answer like, Buggy, Buggy, now we don't know that person. Let's do shocks, etc. And he's getting very frustrated because so he drives there in his car from the 1940s, like an original Model T Forge, you know, has an altercation with a zombie in which he loses his keys. But he's a very, yeah, he's a very great line where he's um driving along by himself. And he's like, oh, do you like my mask? Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. It raises the dead back to life. Bloody Americans, yeah. He's <laughs> a demented driving his tiny, like a giant British man in a tiny car. Yeah, um, yeah. driving along. It's very, very good. And most importantly, the uh, scene at the end of the episode where Giles threatens uh, Snyder. Snyder. Um, do you want to talk about that, Joel? I will briefly. I think it's an, it's an incredible moment uh, in television, television history. but uh, Which Joel has tweeted about about six times, independently thinking it was the first time he's tweeted about it every time. I, I, I enjoy my fresh thoughts as they return to me on Big. Um, but yeah, the, the one of my seminal um, Giles moments is when he's uh, threatening Snyder, saying, you know, you can't keep Buffy out of school, you have no legal right to, and just because you don't like her... Um, doesn't mean you can't uh, give her an education and saying that he'll take it to the state supreme court and it's not like says you know sorry i'm not convinced and tries to walk out and Giles slams him up against the uh, locker and says would you like me to convince you yeah and that's it and buffy's back in school yeah yeah that's a good um, one i did realize I, I i kind of knew this but i i i refreshed myself on it in research this episode but we never find out snyder's name by first name oh that's a good point yeah principal principal <laughs> He's actually a deputy principal. Deputy principal, principal Snyder. Um, one thing that Mark Fields says about this episode, in terms of uh, like an attempt to defense, though he acknowledges that it's not, it's not like doesn't stand up and it's mm. not good, is that um, potentially 
uh, Willow and Xander's voices are in this episode, given that they're often read as being extensions of Buffy's personality to some degree, but Willow being the, sorry, Xander being the heart and Willow being the mind, mm. or no, sorry, not the mind, the spirit um, of Buffy and of the team, um, that they are essentially voicing Buffy's internal struggles, mm-hmm. that they are an expression of Buffy's um, tortured um, inner monologue, um, you know, blaming herself for what's happened. Yeah. So that's interesting. But um, also uh, not true, so that's a shame. <laughs> One of the interesting things about this episode was that while we were watching it, I noticed that what the scene where Buffy's falling asleep at 11.45pm is, or 11.43, is the uh, scene that's been highlighted in a couple of videos about um, the high def uh, remaster of Buffy. Because in that scene, essentially, it was shot in the daytime, but they colour graded it to look like the night. So they just changed the colour balance, um, or they mm-hmm. added a filter to make everything look blue, um, as opposed to you know pale yellow light to signify the daytime sure. and then the hd remake or remaster uh they just didn't color grade it so she's just lying in bed in the middle of the day it looks like she's taking a nap at a quarter to noon um, yeah just lying in her in her night dress or whatever uh, yeah. staring wistfully at the ceiling so we had a look at that while we were like watching the episode and we had a good giggle though so that was nice um, in terms of things being in the daylight actually um, we should mention this episode has another dream sequence she's it walking does. through the um, empty high school um, encounters uh, Angel who is walking in the sunlight in the courtyard in all black and we're in entertaining the possibility that maybe this might be actually his soul trying to communicate with her to sure. some degree um, you ever find that Angel's always fiddling with something in his hands Oh, when well, he walks and talks, at the very least in Buffy, um, he's often turning something over, like a pencil. Oh. It's not a pencil, but something yeah, yeah. around that size in his hands. I'll keep an eye for that. In the um, but he tries to warn her and saying, you know, that they're coming soon, and you know that they're waiting for you, etc. Um, but yeah, was there, it was it was one of my least favorite dream sequences in Buffy ever. It was just so useless. Hey Google, activate bisexual lighting. Yeah, it's uh, not, not definitely not one of the more memorable dream sequences, but to be fair, it's because a lot of them are quite distinct. Yeah, it's so nice that you don't think I'm going to include that in the uh, in the podcast. With no context. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, so, the last point we'll bring up is that this episode is actually, weirdly, it's censored in our version of the DVDs. So, there's a scene in uh, where Giles has basically accidentally been, when he's run through an, a zombie, gone out to check if it's a person, and picks him up by the scruff of their neck... As you reason. do, in Britain. Uh, and uh, it turns out to be a zombie, so he's like, oh, phew, and runs back to his car and gets tackled by a couple of zombies doing some weird, funny walks. Um, he has left Inclu- his- Sorry, including one guy who uh, was given free reign to interpret on what a zombie walk was, and instead of sticking his arms out, he just put his arms out like he was on a cross and wiggled his wrists back and forth out of sync with each other. It yeah. was amazing. Uh, but Jaws has left his keys behind on the floor, so he has to hotwire his car to get it to start. But the American version actually shows him hot wiring the car, and the UK release had to censor that. So they removed the scene, or they removed the shots where he's actually hot wiring it, where you can see him like ripping open the panel and like putting the two wires together and stuff. And I watched the American version, like it's explicit that he does this. Yeah, because I thought there was a jump in this. I yeah, there was a jump. jump. It was a, like you could actually see a jump. Because it's an imitable act. It's an imitable act in the UK, so it would have gotten a 15s rating as opposed to a 12s. Um, also, there is a scene where one of the guys gets his neck snapped in the party that they also cut from the episode. Which is really weird. I mean, like, I don't like that our version didn't have the full episode. Violence, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully they don't do that too often, but maybe they will. It really upsets me, actually, because there's no, like, in my head, like, I'm a big, like, you know, text purist, even though I try not to be. So it means that, like, I like to have, like, the best version of a text. So, like, my copy of Ulysses is, like, the best kind of available version of a text, but also there's no perfect version of Ulysses because it's such a troubled text narratively. But, like, I mean, knowing that there's a... Knowing that our DVD copies, which are the best version of Buffy available because they don't have the shitty remastering, yeah. uh, but they also have deleted scenes, or they have scenes deleted out of them for censorship reasons, I like, that already bothers me. Yeah, but now this is an artifact of a very specific version of it. Sure, you're right. Um, we should also just say, in, uh, in terms of the actual plot of the episode, which really isn't the plot of the episode, but, you know, zombies attack various people. Like, something that apparently this evening is full of people whose hearts just stopped and got run over by a truck or caught fire. Uh, not people who came out of the ground, necessarily, Um come to the, the party. Uh, and in the end, it's actually quite a funny, strange sequence where... 
Charles gets there to tell uh, Buffy that Avamambi means evil eye in vague African language. Nigerian, probably. Um, Sorry, no, they speak Igbo in uh, Nigeria and about, about 500 other languages, so my mistake. Yeah, well, in any, in any event, I, I doubt the writers of this episode were particularly aware of that, um, but uh, come to say, you know, basically stab him in the eyes. And it's interesting that when this mask, uh, essentially, Pat um, gets killed, um, and that must have been the next snapping, actually. No. No? No. I feel like I remember her being killed more explicitly. Yeah, no, she gets, she gets like, fatally wounded, and then they bring her into the bedroom, yeah. and when they go to check on her, she's just died in the meantime. It was yeah. really weird. The mask uh, takes her over, quite like, actually, the film, The Mask. Uh, and I think it's a, a nice bit of... Um, the mask prosthetic itself is quite It was quite pretty nice. good, yeah, yeah. Um, but, interestingly, so she becomes this, the uh, manifestation of Alvin Mombi, um, who is male. Mm. which is kind of an interesting paradigm sure, thing sure. so just like uh, slightly notable um, Giles sends Oz to warn Buffy to hit the eyes he doesn't get a chance to because of a mommy's power is like camera flashing everyone so they forget the things for like four seconds and then in a quite violent uh, kill shot um, she sh- uh, Buffy shoves a shovel through Pac's eyes and all the zombies evaporate and once again Joyce Summers is forced to move on with the murder of someone she knows yeah. and cares about in her house. And like, imagine Pat's family. Like, she got like, I mean, there's waiting for her to come home tonight, and there's not not only is she not going to come home, there's not even a body because it just disappeared. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very upsetting. It's, um, it's, it's, uh, the body has just happened to some other family who doesn't get to be the protagonist. <laughs> yeah, except uh, that episode is going to be called the uh, the body question mark the body. <laughs> uh, so. Are you ready for the dusting, Joel? I'm ready for the dusting, Brian. Okay, um, I'm going to throw some uh, Buffy bits at you, if that's cool with you. Hit me. So there's a deleted scene from this episode uh, where Joyce is talking about Snyder. Um, and what she says is, Have you ever noticed his teeth? They're <laughs> like little tiny rodent teeth. Horrible, gnashing little teeth. You just want to pull them out with pliers. So that's wonderful. Well done. It's not very nice, Aaron Shimmerin. No, I know. I was wondering oh, about that kind of thing. Yeah. Like, I mean, being an actor, like, you know, in a role that's supposed to be, like, physically, like... Uh, a specific well, physicality to it. specific right? physicality that's generally considered to be not very pleasant. It's like, how do you cast that, A, and B, when people are talking about you in the show, does it just really hurt your feelings? Yeah. Uh, anyway, there are a couple of, uh, there's a couple of photos in this episode of the Buffy, of the, of the Scoobies, where they're just being nice and young and stuff, and it's just really nice, and it always makes me sad when you see those ones. Um, it's also clearly just the cast to some degree as well yeah right? sure and what I'll say as well is that um, I like the part where um, Cordelia says I'm the dip yep yeah, yeah. Um, no context required Cordelia chases the dip so what are your Buffy bits Joe? so um, we have a scene at the start of the episode where the Scoobies are acting as uh, reserve slayers while Buffy's away so they have a nice little vampire hunting gear on and all that kind of stuff uh, and when Buffy runs into Xander again for the first time um, he tells her not to sneak up on her it's all fun and games until someone uh, loses an eye um, which is obviously uh, very uh, foreshadowing uh, of Xander losing an eye to Caleb in season 7 he also was like the the photography there was supposed to suggest that he was angel, right? That she was walking up to check if it was angel because you could just see his back, but he was a very tall, brooding. I figure. assume she just assumed it was a vampire. Uh, okay, um, I thought it was suggested. Was Xander a operating under the code name Nighthawk. Yeah, oof. There is a, an interesting uh, bit of a rata where when they're trying to find other schools for her to go into, and uh, where. Uh, Joyce suggests she could go to private school and potentially Miss Porter's private school for girls. So apparently there is a... And Buffy has a very broad understanding, uh, uh, brush strokes, broad strokes of uh, what a private school is because she thinks it's all kilks and jackets and foot, yeah. f- foot binding. So what she says is, uh, she says, Snout's jackets killed to no boys. Want to go through, want to throw in a little foot binding? Yeah, but apparently there's a, a private school, uh, in a preparatory Central, school yeah. in, in, in driving distance in Sunnydale, which I was in Miss Porter's school, um, which could be a, a side plot for some witchery. Um, and otherwise, uh, notable for this episode is they introduced the downtown Sunnydale set. Uh, sure. Most significantly, the espresso pump, um, which now that these uh, teens are getting older, uh, they can drink their coffee and uh, have various daytime scenes and uh, perhaps most... Um, Heartwarmingly is where Giles um, does his open mic night. Does his open mic night, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so we, we have that set now, which eventually the magic box and various other things will be added to. 
Absolutely. Okay, um, fashion. Uh, Buffy wears a really disgusting pink dress to her party. I hated it. It was the worst thing I've seen I think Sarah Michelle Gellar wearing so far. It was just like a violent pink and it just didn't look nice. I don't, I don't need to justify it myself to you, Joel. Okay. Um, I hated just generally the um, costumes. I will say costumes that all the zombies were wearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because it was just very... Um, it was not of the same standard as the regular cast. There was like a random cheerleader. There was a guy in a really big suit because he's a suit man. Um, there was a guy which the Wikipedia noticed, noticed was dressed and saw very similarly to Daryl from uh, the season two mm. episode. Mm. Um, some assembly required, which also was about a reanimated um, person. Yeah. Um, Xander's hair is just ter- generally terrible in this episode as well. It's in between two hairstyles. It's just yeah. always, always a challenging time. And uh, Oz is wearing a weird, like, Japanese-inspired short-sleeved shirt, short-sleeved shirt in this episode where it has, like, a kind of a Japanese imperial sun on the back. It was kind of weird. I don't know what's going on there. And, of course, everyone who came to the the party just looked like, dude, where's my car? Yeah, um, we did. They had, uh, and Devon, who's a league of um, things like my baby, baby, was wearing... A like bright yellow tropical shirt that was ten sizes too big, and of everyone was wearing weird fishing hats because sometimes stoners in the nineties wore what were basically fishing hats. Yeah, well, I was wearing her hair completely pulled back in this episode as well. At one point, I didn't like it. Yeah, maybe it's meant to indicate her severity. Maybe. Uh, and Pac's look was obviously meant to be quite frumpy, but it was very uh, a different kind of school librarian vibe. Yeah, give us a that hand, Joe. So quite a bit of death in the zombie episode. Um, so there was the vampire dusted by Buffy. There was the undead cat Patches became a zombie. Uh, there was a, a, a generic group of Sunnydale Dale citizens who become zombies, including a man killed in a car accident, one who died of extensive burns. Uh, the burn man also killed a doctor and a nurse in his hospital room. That was uh, kind of ambiguous. I'm not sure if that was confirmed. but anyway. it, was ref- it was reflected in his heart monitor, which was okay. at zero. Uh, there was a young man who, in some versions of this episode, has neck snapped uh, by a zombie. Uh, Pat uh, evaporated, uh, RIP. Uh, Avu Mom- Mombangi, uh, who is the uh, the demon, the zombie demon, was killed with a shovel through the eyes. And all the zombies technically were also destroyed when Avu mm. Mombangi. Oh, I have another little bit of quick buffy bit. Mombangi. So this episode's title is actually, um, the Dead, Dead Man's Party is actually based on a... A uh, song by Oingo, B- Oingo Boingo, who are was the band that Danny Elfman like started back in the seventies. They're not very good. They're kind of ska-ish, mm. but yeah, I don't like them. So there you go. I'm gonna say that one more time just for absolute clarity. Avu Mobani. Cool. So what's your rating, Joe? I would probably give this episode a six point four, um, which may be slightly generous. Six point four um, ocular shovels. Oh, very good and it's because I think it's, it's, it's obviously weirdly disjointed uh, I think Joyce is uh, content is really good uh, I think Jaws's content is really good there's a lot of interesting little elements um, but the central plot which revolves around this conversation this confrontation completely weak yeah. and really takes it down yeah. um, so very monster of the week and a big of a uh, it takes the wind out of the sails a little bit given how many strong episodes we've had in a run I agree. I'm going to give it 4.7 boy problems out of 10. Wow. Okay, yeah, because really? boy, this is a problem. I need to I need to get back to giving harsher ratings, I think. I mean, for the bad ones, yeah. 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 I mean, we've, we've, we've yeah, it just it wasn't good. Marty Knoxon, I'm disappointed in you, to be honest. Please come on our show. Please come on our show. Uh, so next week is going to be Faith, Hope and Trick. So that's really exciting because I do love Faith. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, looking forward to it. Looking forward to all our faith discussion um, for our um, spin-off podcast, uh, Faithful, Faithful Fellas. Uh, oh, I can't tell you what I was going to say. Never mind. Faithful fuckers. So okay, okay just a second there. Okay, well, thanks very much for listening to Buffy Boys. Thank you for your patience and your patronage. And we will see you uh, next week uh, in Faith, Hope and Trick. Um, tell your friends, uh, tell your rogan teeth as school principals. Uh, to listen to Buffy Boys and follow us on Twitter and generally enjoy yourselves with our content. Please. Please. We'll see you next week on Buffy. Buffy Boys. Okay, bye. See ya.